David Sirota is the progressive talk radio host on Colorado's AM 760 Morning Show, also author of the book Back to Our Future. David, great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. So you talk, uh, I talk a lot, a lot about the military industrial complex. And in your book, you outline the military entertainment complex. You talk a lot about the movies, books and pop culture stuff from the 80s and how it links to what's happening today. Go into a little bit about how you first got involved with this topic. I mean, what piqued your interest? Uh, basically, I was um, I was at home um, watching on a Saturday night. Uh, Ghostbusters, actually, and uh, and I, I put something out on my Twitter feed. Uh, I put a, I forget what line it was from Ghostbusters, and I got all these people uh, twittering back the exact line, you know, it, almost in a, a call and response. And I was wondering, I was like, what? Why are so many people kind of keyed in uh, in such a in such a, a hardwired way uh, to 80s pop culture products like the Ghostbusters? And then I started thinking, uh, you know, what what is the Ghostbusters really uh, all about? What's the storyline of the Ghostbusters? And the storyline of the Ghostbusters is uh, private contractors can are the only ones that we can rely on in a crisis. You can't rely on government uh, to, to solve society's problems. And I started thinking, well, you know, uh, I'm a child of the 80s. How many other stories were told to me uh, like this when I was a kid? And I, I sort of went from there down, uh, down uh, the rabbit hole. Uh, and what you find is that a lot of the ways uh, that we talk about politics today and major issues today uh, come right out of those stories that uh, children were being told uh, through entertainment products in the 1980s. So that makes some sense. Uh, the 80s children have grown up. Uh, a lot of 80s uh, kids, uh, people who were culturalized in the 80s, Eighties are now uh, in world shaping and media shaping and policy shaping positions in, in in our world. So it makes some sense. And and from there, I I kind of started uh, researching it. And and you mentioned uh, one good example uh, of many out of the nineteen eighties, the military entertainment complex. Uh, and this is one of the most disturbing uh, parts of the book in, in writing and researching it for me was the direct links between the Pentagon uh, and Hollywood that were forged in the 1980s. Uh, yeah, so through... talk about that specifically a little. I mean, there are cases, There's the you mentioned the movie Red Dawn quite a bit mm -hmm. in the book, and mm -hmm. I did some research about this, and there are instances where the Pentagon has, in, in response to proposals about a movie that involves either the military or war or whatever, Pentagon has basically said, you take direction from us or you don't do this movie, right? That's exactly right. And, and basically the Pentagon says, if, if you're willing to edit your script in the ways that we want you to edit them for content, literally for pro-military, pro-war content, then you can have access at a subsidized rate to military hardware for the purposes of filming your movie. So for instance, Top Gun did this, and Top Gun spent a combined total of about a, only a million bucks total. Uh, on all of those flight scenes. Now, I can tell you one thing, those flight scenes cost a lot more than a million bucks, the fuel, the, the personnel. Uh, and, and similarly, what the, uh, what the Pentagon was doing in the 1980s and since the 1980s, that's the key point, since the 1980s, uh, was saying to, to Hollywood that if you don't edit uh, for content uh, movies on the basis of what we want, you will not have access uh, to military hardware. So this explains why since the 1980s for every one or two movies uh, that really uh, questions and indicts the concept of war and militarism, you get scores of movies uh, that are pro-military, pro-militarism, pro-war. It's because as the director of Hunt for Red October said, uh, once this kind of thing became so strong in the 1980s, uh, Hollywood studios would go to screenwriters and still do go to screenwriters and say, either you get the military's approval uh, for the content of your script or don't even think about uh, this movie that you're proposing ever being made. And the motivations on both sides seem clear. I mean, the Pentagon wants to control the narrative when it involves those issues. The people who are making the movies believe they will be profitable. If that's what they have to do to make the movie. Then they then they do it. I'm curious. Have you interviewed on your show Dave Zirin? I have. Dave Zirin, I find to be a fascinating guy, and we did kind of a, a Monday morning quarterback of the Super Bowl, and mm -hmm. it's amazing the amount of militaristic, uh, corporatist, misogynistic stuff that it's almost completely blend, blended into the background to where we don't even notice it. And, and, in, and this, in, in your book, there's a lot of examples on specifically on the military and war side where, again, it's just part of the culture, like you mentioned. 
And, and I think that's a really important point, that the, the lack of transparency, how invisible and, as you say, embedded it is, uh, makes it that much more powerful. You know, I, I think that most of us would agree that, that messages that we see as explicitly political, we have filters. We, we say, okay, this is a politician talking to me, this is a political commercial talking to me. There's something of a filter that happens there. When you're talking about popular culture, entertainment culture, uh, where political messages, ideological messages are embedded in that, uh, your filter is down uh, so that the ideology, the propaganda is more powerful. And this is particularly true when it comes to propaganda or pop culture that's aimed at children who, who don't have much of a filter at all. This is why since the 1980s, sociologists have been telling us through studies uh, that kids uh, form their political ideology as much from entertainment culture as they do from real world events and news events. And so what happened in the 1980s was, not just on militarism but on everything, it was the first time that, that the media was consolidated in such a way, uh, 50 companies controlling most uh, uh, movie houses, television stations, newspapers, and the like. The first time that there was that kind of consolidation to deliver in a repetitive fashion, in a cross-platform fashion, the kind of messages on militarism, on greed, on the economy uh, to children than they had ever been able to deliver it before. So as I say in the book, as one example, uh, the uh, ET the movie E.T., the parable of kids having to run away from the government, really an anti-government parable. Uh, you didn't just see this on your movie uh, screen. You saw it uh, on your video games. Uh, you saw it on your lunchbox. You saw it in action figures. You saw it in serial. So this was the first time that there was this instrument of propaganda that was so finely tuned. And we talked just last week about the two stations that were TV stations that were fined by the FCC for running uh, corporate produced video news releases as news. And you're exactly right. And, and the issue is not whether they contain false information, but the fact that it is being presented as if it is a news editorial piece when it is not that. That's um, right. It pre presented as apolitical. That's it, right. Exactly. Now, in, in the book, you also talk about a little bit in the last couple minutes we have here, your understand, to understand the Barack Obama presidency, you actually refer back to the Cosby show. And this is one that I think might be a, a little less obvious to some people. Address that a little. Yeah, the, the, I argue and I think the, the, the evidence shows that the whole concept of racial transcendence uh, or color blindness really comes out of the 1980s, both uh, from uh, the, the Reagan revolution uh, and from a lot of the pop culture products, uh, including, of course, The Cosby Show. There was a big debate uh, when The Cosby Show came out about uh, whether The Cosby Show was adequately addressing uh, questions of structural and institutional racism. And, and what came out of the audience studies uh, in that time, with Ronald Reagan running around the country, actually citing the civil rights movement as proof that the country was a colorblind society, what came out of the debate about the Cosby Show uh, from white audiences was white audiences specifically like the Cosby Show because it didn't address questions of racism, uh, institutional and enduring questions of racism. And so what I think we've seen is, and I don't blame Bill Cosby, just like I don't blame Barack Obama, is that what really comes out of the 80s is this idea that the only way for African Americans at a mass level, at a public level to be successful is for African Americans and minorities in general uh, to uh, present themselves as having gone beyond their race. Now, what's so offensive about this is uh, it's the white audience effectively demanding that minorities, people who are non-white, uh, go beyond, transcend who they really are. And I think this is, again, not a criticism of Barack Obama or Bill Cosby. It's a criticism of a white America that insists that people who are not white uh, be uh, run away from who they really are. Well, the, the Cosby, uh, the entire Cosby thing is fascinating. And I've actually had uh, at, at the University of Massachusetts when I was mm -hmm. a student, Sut Jolly, the executive mm -hmm. director of the Media Education Foundation as a professor. And he made a brilliant point about, we, he addressed some of the things you're addressing, but he also said part of the, there was kind of an unwritten deal with the Cosby show, which was, uh, you watch this show and w white people watch this show and this show will not make you feel guilty and it will not uh, it will keep some narratives out that will be inherently uncomfortable. And it was kind of this unwritten deal. How, what do you think of that? I think that's exactly right. And, and it effectively absolved a white America uh, from a persistent 
institutional uh, racism. And I think what that has become since the 80s is really a demand by the white audience that African Americans uh, and minorities in general in public positions don't challenge them. Because if they do, there is clearly a, going to be a backlash. And we've seen this uh, in, in almost every presidential race. I mean, when, when uh, the Republicans tried to tie uh, Bill Clinton uh, to, uh, to the civil rights movement, uh, when the Republicans tried to tie uh, Barack Obama to Jeremiah Wright, Right. This was through the frame, the argument, the underlying argument was that Barack Obama is not effectively getting beyond uh, his race. He is not effectively forgiving white America hmm. for persistent and institutional racism. And the problem with this, of course, is that it ignores what I'm saying. It ignores the actual persistent and institutional problem of racism. I wish we had more time. David Sirota, progressive talk radio host on Colorado's AM 760. The book is called Back to Our Future. Highly recommended. So thanks so much for doing this, David. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay.